Now I want to ask you a question today. I think I know the answer. Does anybody here want to have enemies? Well, you say, of course not. We don't want to have enemies. Well, that's probably true. But how many of you know that in politics, we have found that enemies can actually be kind of helpful? <laughs> Let me tell you what I mean. Back in 1932, in October of 1932, uh, when Franklin Roosevelt was running for president for his first term, he had gone to Portland, Oregon, Oregon to drum up some votes. And while he was there, he was going to make a speech, of course. And one of the things in his speech was a controversial subject at the time. And that was whether utilities should be privately owned or governed by the government, federal, state, local, etc. Well, we've solved that issue for the most part. But in 1932, it was a controversial subject. And uh, while he was there talking to the people, Franklin Roosevelt determined, made a political calculation that the people who opposed his point of view on that subject were actually more unliked and unpopular even than the subject matter, regardless of which side of the aisle people were on on the matter. So during his speech, he made a political calculation as he advocated for his position on whether utilities should be privately or government controlled. He made this famous statement, judge me by the enemies I've made. Well, there was an uproarious applause and he won the day because the people that opposed him were more unpopular than the issue itself. Well, it seems like in the last 86 years, our political leaders have made the idea of judging them by the enemies they have made a political art form. Because political rhetoric today is full of hate and venom. We are becoming a nation of enemies. Now, some of you may say, well, pastor, I don't have any enemies. Well, bless you. <laughs> Here's what I would advocate that you do. If you, if you are living in that bubble <laughs> and you believe you have no enemies, open a Twitter account. <laughs> Go on to Twitter and express an opinion on any subject whatsoever. And you will find very quickly that somebody somewhere despises you. <laughs> uh, I have learned, because I am, a, I am in the Twitterverse, I, I, I work Twitter. I have found that Twitter is blood sport. And if you don't want to be called out by somebody you've never met and you've never talked to, if you don't want to be treated like an absolute inhuman, don't go on Twitter. But the reality is our politics have made enemies of us all. But it's not just politics. I mean, after all, if you want to talk about enemies... We've been in a war on terror for almost 20 years. If you want to talk about enemies, let me ask you a practical question. Practical question. Do you lock your doors at night when you turn out the lights and go to bed? When you go down to the grocery store or the gas station or the mall or to the school to drop off your kids, do you lock your doors? You say, well, of course. Why? Why? Because not everyone who lives in our community is an honest person. There are people without scruples. There are people who would be willing to take advantage of you if you were to leave your door unlocked. And then let's be perfectly frank about it. We are now living in a nation of mass shooters. I wish it weren't true. But we live in a nation where people are willing to walk into crowded public places, the more vulnerable the better, 
and just start shooting. These people have the conscience of a shark. And this nation of ours has become a nation where this kind of thing is more commonplace. But let's bring it down even closer to home. Do you ever have conflicts in your workplace? We call it office politics, where people don't always act in a friendly way toward each other. Let's get it even a little closer. Have you ever, now, what I'm about to say, only fools fear to tread into what I'm about to talk about. <laughs> Have you ever talked to a family member or a friend who's in the middle of divorce proceedings about how they feel about their ex right then? <laughs> now, sometimes it's amicable. and Sometimes it is not a pretty picture. In fact, have you ever talked to anyone who is in the middle of a custody trial for their children? I mean, think about the way we talk about that. We don't even refer to custody trials as custody trials. We refer to them constantly and commonly as custody battles. Jesus was right that sometimes our enemies are the members of our own household. So it's into this supercharged culture of anger and hostility and enemies that Jesus says something that is counterintuitive and difficult to live by. Jesus said, love your enemies. You may say, well, now, Pastor, I'll be honest with you. I'm not guilty of everything on that list you just ran through, but there are a couple things there that I will own up to, and I want to ask you one simple question. Give me one good reason why I should love my enemies. Well, I won't give you one. I'll give you two. As we look together at the subject today, reasons to love your enemies. Would you open your Bibles once again to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, as we look together at reasons to love your enemies. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 43, Jesus is the only one speaking in this entire passage. Watch this. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect." In other words, Jesus is saying here, I am calling you to a standard that is different than the standard you're accustomed to. I'm calling you to a standard that is different than even the standard of those who follow the highest ethical standards of religion. I am calling you, my people, my disciples, my new community, the Jesus people. I'm calling you to live by a standard that frankly is impossible without the grace and help of God. I'm calling you to love your enemies. I love what John R. W. Stott, the Anglican New Testament scholar, said about this two decades ago when he said, all human love, even the highest, the noblest, and the best, is contaminated to some degree by the impurities of self-interest. We Christians are specifically called to love our enemies, parenthetically, in which love there is no self-interest, and this is impossible without the supernatural grace of God. Jesus, who anticipated this culture we live in today, said to every person who would ever be his follower, love your enemies. Now, this is the sixth of six analogies that Jesus gives, which start with the phrase, you have heard it said, 
But I say to you, you have heard it said, but I say to you. You remember when Jesus made the claim earlier in chapter 5, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He gives us six examples of how he fulfills the Old Testament teaching. He's not destroying it. He's fulfilling it. And what he is saying is this. The Old Testament teaches this standard, but I am calling you to a higher standard than how you have interpreted the Old Testament teaching. You say, what do you mean? Well, for instance, he gives us six examples. You know, the number seven is the number for completion. If Jesus had given us seven examples, it may indicate that this is all you got to worry about. Get these seven handled. But he gives us six, leaving it incomplete, as if to suggest when you look at the Old Testament, regardless of where you read, you better interpret everything the Old Testament says through the prism, the grid, through the uh, filter of a Savior who was crucified for you, dead, buried, resurrected, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and coming again someday. You cannot understand any part of the Old Testament without understanding the Lord Jesus and what he did to redeem you and save you and give you forgiveness and everlasting life. That's the filter by which we interpret everything in the Old Testament. So Jesus gives us these six areas where, and they're merely examples, but they're powerful examples because he said, you know what? For instance, he said, uh, starting in verse 21, you have heard it said, thou shalt not murder. Well, yeah, it's in, the, it's in the Ten Commandments. You've heard it said, thou shalt not murder. I say to you, don't even be angry with your brother. You have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. I say to you, don't even lust in your heart. You have heard it said, if you want to divorce your wife, make sure the paperwork is correct and send her away. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife except for the cause of marital infidelity harms his wife and leads her to a life of sin. You have heard it said, don't swear falsely. In other words, he's not talking about swearing in the sense of cussing. He's talking about making an oath like, I swear to God. Jesus said, do not. You've heard it say, don't swear falsely. I say to you, don't swear at all. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye. But I say to you, turn the other cheek. And you've heard it said, hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. Now, this may be the most demanding of all these, these standards because it is the most contradictory to human nature. Anybody who has ever been hated, loathed, mistreated, harassed, molested, lied about, cursed, criticized relentlessly will know that it is not the first reaction of human nature to say, I love you for that. That's so nice of you. Thank, bring it on. Give me more. <laughs> it's antithetical to our human nature to love those who hate us. But few things will demonstrate our faith in Jesus Christ more quickly than our willingness to love those who seem to be our enemies. So there's a couple principles I want us to know, so I'm going to do this quick. Principle number one, we love our enemies in order to demonstrate our walk with the Lord. We love our enemies to demonstrate our walk with the Lord. Now here's what I mean. Look at verse 43 again. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the just, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, you follow a God who loves everybody. How is it that you can follow a God who loves everybody, 
and decide that you will love only a few? How can you define categories of people or individuals and say, I will love everybody but you? When you follow a God who loves the just as well as the unjust, who sends his reign on the wicked and the, and, the, and the pure, who blesses both those who love him and those who do not. Let me bring it down a little closer. Do you believe that love or hate shows the world we follow Jesus? Let me ask it again. Do you think that love or hate shows the world that we follow Jesus? Do you think hating people or loving people is a more Christ-like virtue? <laughs> These questions don't even demand much thought, do they? The answers are self-revealing. I love what Michael Green, the British New Testament scholar, said when he said, Be like God in undiscriminating and undifferentiating love towards all. That is the mark of the master, and that is the mark of of the disciple. Now, I said there were six analogies. Don't murder, I say don't hate. Don't commit adultery, I say don't even lust, and on and on. All of them come from the Old Testament except the sixth one. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, hate your enemy. Actually, there is no reference in the Old Testament. There's no commandment found anywhere in the Old Testament where God says, hate your enemy. What had happened is this. The, the teachers of the law had extrapolated this concept from some passages in the Old Testament. They said, look, it makes sense to love your neighbor. By the same token, it makes total sense to hate your enemy. And nobody questioned that because why? It's so much a part of human nature. It's so much a part of human nature. If you strike me, I'll strike you back. If you curse me, I'll curse you back. If you uh, criticize me, I will criticize you back. I will give as good as I get, and I will fight fire with fire. That's the way we think. That's how we operate. And so they had come to believe that hating your enemy was actually a response to serving God, that it was a normal, natural thing to hate other people in the name of your love for God. And Jesus said, I know that's what your teachers have taught you. I know that's what you believe down deep in your heart, that that seems normal and natural and acceptable. But I'm saying to you, that's wrong. You're to love your enemies. Jesus turns the issue not merely into a legal checklist or an ethical standard by which we uh, come to this list of thou's, do's, and don'ts, and we say, well, this is what my religion teaches, so I accept it. Jesus said, no, it's more than that. It's something that springs from your heart. The, the willingness to love your enemy is not just accepting what your religion teaches like some ethical standard that's somewhat at arm's length from how you really live, but instead it's a reflection of your walk with God himself. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, let me say it this way. You loving your enemy is not first and foremost about you and your enemy. You and me being called to love our enemies is first and foremost a reflection of our love and our relationship with the Lord. You say, Bowman, where do you get this stuff? Right here in the Bible. It's right here. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that there's the reason. There's the incentive. What he's about to say is the incentive for loving your enemy. He said, love them, pray for them, so that what? You may be sons of your Father in heaven. In other words, this is about you and God. First and foremost, your response to your enemy is not about you and them. It's about you and him. In fact, this would have made more sense to us if the passage had said, love your enemies because they need it. 
Like somehow the Taliban woke up this morning saying, I hope Bowman loves me today. (laughs) Now, I'm not saying that your enemy doesn't benefit from your love, but Jesus does not offer sentimentality as a rationale for love. He does not say, love your enemies because somewhere down deep you need it. Although there's something messed up about us if we live our lives in hatred. If we will not forgive and if we will not go beyond how others have hurt us and love them in spite of what they've done to us and the injury they've caused to us, there will be something missing in our faith. But Jesus does not reduce loving your enemies to how it impacts them or you. Jesus says, love your enemies so that you may be the sons of your Father which is in heaven. In other words, if you're going to follow the God that the Bible claims so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, then there is absolutely no one that you can draw a fence around and say, you know what, I love everybody but you. It's impossible. You see, what Jesus is describing here is a spiritual discipline. It's a rationale based on the highest possible standard. I have to love other people, not because I find them lovely or because I can tolerate their actions or because I believe that what they're doing is right or good or pure. I have to love other people because I am a follower of Jesus Christ. It is a spiritual response to my Father in heaven that causes me to live outside of my own feelings and my own prejudice and my own biases and say, because of the glory of God, I choose to love other people regardless of what they've done or how they've treated me. I want to tell you something. Once you and I uh, 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 accept that standard for how we love the world, it broadens the circle of who's included in And those we love and those we don't, pretty wide. In other words, Jesus makes it a spiritual discipline. If somebody gets saved, what do we do? We baptize them. We teach them to read the Bible every day. We encourage them to pray every day. We we want them to go to church and be a part of the fellowship of the believers because How many of you know if you don't go to church and you're not around other believers, you're going to cool off and your fire for Jesus is going to be a little more, uh, you know, incomplete. These are all spiritual disciplines. And when somebody gets saved, we we tell them, look, you've got to start a Bible study, a prayer life. You, you, You need to be baptized. You need to go to church. But what Jesus is saying is this. Those are all good things. Those are all absolutely true things. But one of the things we need to understand is that a spiritual discipline in the Christian life is not only read your Bible and pray, but love your enemies. That's part of it. In fact, Jesus, you may say, well, who exactly are my enemies? Well, Jesus describes it for us here. Because he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He gives us two words to describe the enemy. First, he says the enemy. The word for enemy is the Greek word that the root word is to hate. So if there's anybody that hates you, you say, well, I'm not aware of anybody that hates me. Well, that must be a wonderful way to live. Amen. (laughs) Do you hate anybody? The word enemy means to hate. Now, you know, 20 years ago, we used to preach to our congregations and say, we've undervalued the word love. Now we've undervalued the word hate. Now if you disagree with me, you're a hater. Jesus isn't talking about that political disagreement that we automatically assess the person who disagreed with me, you're a hater. Jesus is talking about something that comes from the soul where a person just absolutely cannot stand the other person. They wish them harm, hate. The second thing he said, pray for those who persecute you. The word persecute, same word we looked at last week when Jesus said, blessed are those who, who, blessed are the persecuted for righteousness sake. The word persecuted means to be hounded, to be pursued, to be, you know, uh, chased by a predator. So the person who molests and harasses and criticizes and wishes you harm, that's the person who is your enemy. So Jesus describes the enemy as the haters and the harassers in your life. 
They may be political. They may be somebody in your family. They may be somebody you work with. But Jesus said, your response to them is a spiritual response. It's not just an ethical response that we can hold at arm's length. It's a spiritual response. You say, why do you say that? Because look what he said. Love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute. Those are spiritual responses. Those are responses that don't come from your head. They come from your heart. They're responses that don't come from sentimentality. They come from a commitment to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus said this, he was not speaking, first and foremost, to a 21st century audience. These words speak to us, but his first audience was a first century Jewish audience. Do you remember the context? Israel was under the political domination of Rome. There was a Roman governor that controlled their daily lives. Remember Pontius Pilate. Roman soldiers patrolled their highways and their communities and their villages and had absolute authority over the daily lives of the people. And I want to tell you something. There was no love lost for Rome. They hated the Romans. In fact, 35 years or so after Jesus made this statement, the Roman government destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, and it has never been rebuilt to this day. So we're not the first people who have ever had enemies. We're not the first people who have ever heard Jesus say, love your enemies, and something rises up inside of us that says, art thou kidding me? <laughs> it was in that constant threat of political turmoil that Jesus spoke to his disciples and said, look, I'm not setting up a worldly kingdom. I'm setting up a spiritual kingdom. And in my kingdom, in my community, in my church, my people will love those who hate them. First and foremost, as a spiritual response to my love for God who loves the people who hate me. I don't know if you've ever heard the name of Dr. Paul David Yonggi Cho. For many years, until his retirement, he was the pastor of the world's largest church on Yoido Island in Seoul, South Korea. He started the church about 1958, and uh, it quickly became the largest church in the world. At its peak, it had a membership of 830,000 people. That would make it like the fifth largest denomination in America. It was a church. Their building was a massive silo with rows and rows and tiers and tiers of, of balconies. They had services all day, every day, multiple campuses around the city. And nobody has ever come close to building anything like what Cho founded and built on Yoido Island in Seoul, South Korea. It's still the largest church in the world, although its membership has declined somewhat. Well, Pastor Cho grew up in Korea during Japanese occupation during World War II. And he was a personal witness to the atrocities of the Japanese soldiers against the Korean people. And as a little child, along with most of the other people that he knew, he developed an intense hatred for the Japanese. And when God called him to preach in the 1950s, just 10 years after the end of Japanese occupation, just 10 years after World War II, Cho said, God, I'll go anywhere and I'll preach anywhere you want me to preach except Japan. Because even though God was blessing him and he loved the Lord, he could not overcome his animosity toward the Japanese people. It was an irrational hatred based on their irrational treatment of his people when he was a kid growing up. So the day came when God called him to go preach to a Japanese congregation in Japan. 
He was to preach to a thousand Japanese pastors. And he began to pray and he began to say, Lord, I'm going to do this, but everything in me says I don't want to. He got over there. They were, even while they were introducing him, pastor of the world's largest church, on and on, author, etc. He was fighting this feeling of hatred toward the Japanese. When he stood up to preach, as he opened his mouth, his emotions overrode his intellect. And against his better judgment, years of resentment came spewing out, and he's looked out across that Japanese audience. These were his first words, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. I don't know if you've ever preached a sermon, but that's got to be the worst introduction <laughs> I've ever heard. And as he said those words, he crumpled, fell to the ground, weeping uncontrollably. And first one, and then two, and then finally a thousand Japanese pastors surrounded him knelt before him and asked him for forgiveness. In that moment, something transformative happened. He had not loved his enemy, but his enemy had loved him. And in the face of that overwhelming wave of love, Cho's heart was melted and transformed and changed so that from then on, his message was, I love you, I love you, I love you. Now let me ask you a real simple question. You don't have to be a historian to come to a conclusion on this. If Jesus had said on that hillside above the Sea of Galilee 2,000 years ago, and said to his followers, now look, I want you to go out and hate these Romans with everything you've got. Fight them everywhere you see them. Resist them. Hate them. Give in to your hatred. How long do you think the Christian church would have survived? I want to suggest to you that if Jesus' message would have been a message of hating their enemies, the Roman government would have squashed Christianity like you step on a scorpion you see in your bedroom. But instead, he preached this radical, almost inhuman view, love your enemies. And as a result, the Roman Empire came and went, but the church of Jesus Christ is still around. But I'm going to tell you something. We're always one generation away from extinction. And it is only when we recover these radical perspectives that Jesus calls us to. It's only when we recover the willingness to love our enemy that we have any real viability in a culture in which everybody seems to be at one another's throat. So in this nation of enemies, we are called to something totally different, completely radical. We're not called to agree with everybody. We're not called to endorse everyone's way of life or their political viewpoints. We're not called to blend into the woodwork and just be unseen. But we are called to love our enemies the way God loves us. What will you do about that?